This is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting episode for you. And I'm on another field trip, and this is going to be a super cool one. I'm super excited to be here. Where we're at today is we're actually at Hippocrates Health Institute here in West Palm Beach, Florida. So the motto of Hippocrates is that they're helping people help themselves. Now, what is Hippocrates? You may have heard that. I think it's some like famous Greek dude. I don't know, something like from the olden days. And basically, he said. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. So that's how this whole place was founded, on those principles. And what they specifically do here is that they teach people how to help themselves by eating healthy, staying fit, getting exercise, and all that good stuff. So one of the things they do here is with they help people that are maybe not in optimal health. People that have been maybe eating a standard American diet and, and got unhealthy and maybe even got a sickness or disease. I mean, there's many testimonials of people that have come here with things like cancer and different diseases in the body and have gotten better by just simply allowing the body to heal itself when you're doing the right stuff. So that's what they teach here. They actually have a few different courses, a three week program where you come here and get fully immersed in education and eating the proper foods so that people can get healthier. One of the things actually I've been wanting to do lately is actually I've been telling my parents for like the last three years that if they wanna come for three weeks I'll pay for them to come here and yes it can get quite expensive but the question I have for you is how much is your health worth I mean my health is worth more than all the money in the world so if I have to charge it on my credit card or go into debt it's worth it to me because if with you know you can't do anything with all the money in the bank at the end of your life but you can do something if you're healthy vibrant and strong so anyways that's what they do here and uh, the purpose of this video is today is because part of their program is about getting people to eat green. Eat green foods. I mean, my show is called Growing Your Greens because greens are very important. And the diet here at Hippocrates is based around eating green foods. Eating things like green sprouts and leafy green vegetables. That's a big part. And the chlorophyll in the greens, which is, you know, in my opinion, one of the things that are really healing for the body. So uh, why I'm here today is to show you guys how they grow their leafy greens that the people that pay a lot of money to be here get to eat and also some of them get to learn how to do it. Actually, they have a couple different programs. A three-week program immerses you in this stuff and you get to learn about the diet and eat the diet. You also learn how to grow your own sprouts and you get tours of the actual farm here. And then they have a nine-week program to actually teach you how to teach others about this program so that you could go out in the world and make positive changes in the world and teaching people about a, a healthy diet to eat. And those uh, health educators get to you learn how to go do sprouting. They get to learn how to grow their own food in the garden and uh, all kinds of other cool stuff. So why I'm here today is to actually specifically show you guys how they teach growing the food in the greenhouse, which are the sprouts and the uh, uh, small leafy greens like the microgreens. And also we're gonna go into their farm and garden and show you guys how they grow here. So wherever you live, you could always grow sprouts. And uh, if you're in South Florida, you'll see some of the unique and specific varieties they're growing in their farm and also I'm gonna make some recommendations probably they could uh, do to improve what they're doing here because I think it's truly great so I guess next let's head over and uh, go into the greenhouse and show you guys how they're growing their sprouts and how you can too all right so you guys caught me enjoying the South Florida Sun here um, as you can see we're like sitting on a little pond here actually this is a amazing property they actually have 50 acres or nearly 50 acres here but we're not here to look at ponds or any of the other cool landscape. I want to see the stuff that's growing that people eat because, you know, while this looks cool, it's not edible. So uh, what we're going to do next is actually go to the greenhouse, which is right behind me here. And uh, first we're going to check out the sprouts that they're growing in there and share you with you guys how you can grow inside your house sprouts year-round. Now we're at the entrance to the greenhouse and they're open 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. But just because they're open doesn't mean you can come to visit. This is actually only for um, people that are staying on site at Hippocrates at any given time. There are about 100 students here learning to improve their health and their life through eating a healthy plant-based lifestyle. So if you want to get a personal tour of the place, you can get a whole tour of the facility and learn more about them by coming out actually any Thursday or Saturday at noon and they'll give you a whole tour including a quick tour of the greenhouse and uh, what they do here. But if you want to come on a tour, I recommend you actually come on the last Wednesday of the month. You want to come at 4.15, they have what's called the Save Your Life Day. And at 4.15, they'll give you a tour for 45 minutes. And then at 5 o'clock, you'll get to hear an informative lecture and get to eat free dinner 
and I've eaten there many times. It's actually, it's a quite good dinner, especially for free. So yeah, you can come and get a whole tour of the place, but they do not allow any uh, outside visitors uh, to the facilities to tour any of the things that I'm showing you guys today. I have actually a special behind the scenes pass just for you guys. So uh, before we go into the greenhouse, the part that is really important is starting with the soil. The soil is the key to growing some of the greens that they're growing in the trays inside, which would include the sunflower greens, the pea greens, and the wheatgrass. So actually, let's uh, spin around and show you guys how they do that. It all starts with the soil, and actually right in here, they get a good soil mixture, and they're using a local place called Odom's, I believe, to get the soil mixture. This is a nice, rich, black, dark soil. I'm sure it's very nutrient-dense and also organically produced. So they take this soil, they fill up it in these trays right here. And these are your standard nursery trays that have uh, very few holes in the bottom. You know, I like to get these trays, you can buy these, but I like to get them at like a big box store when I'm buying trays of plants and I'll bring them home. But a lot of those ones have large holes in the bottom. I'll just put a layer of newspaper and then pile the soil on. They've actually packed the soil in here pretty tightly and uh, it's about halfway full. So you can see they have all these flats ready to grow and literally what they're doing here is they're growing food or the sprouts in a production scale so that they can feed the visitors here all the wheatgrass juice they want and as well as uh, provide all the sprouts that the uh, guests here will be eating for lunch and dinner. After they have the trays full of soil, they're gonna go in the greenhouse and start growing. Now, this is a controlled environment, actually, wow. And actually they cool it because we are in South Florida, it's actually quite warm and humid. And one of the big problems with growing food is the humidity. And they definitely need some airflow going, otherwise mold can be created. So if you're growing your own sprouts, you definitely wanna have some uh, air circulation. Don't just put them in a dark room with with no fans or anything like that. Very important for the air circulation. So uh, really quick, what I'm gonna show you guys is just the two ways they are actually uh, growing food or sprouting inside here. They're first doing these little trays here. So this is something like the alfalfa sprouts and there's many ways to do sprouts. You know, I like this uh, device called the Easy Sprout and I'll have an episode on that really soon for you guys to show how easy it is to sprout with the Easy Sprout. Because they're doing it on a more production scale you know, it would not be practical to do it in the Easy Sprout. So they're using these little uh, grids here, which are just some uh, plastic with holes in it. And as you can see, all the roots uh, grow down through there and it kind of anchors it. So this makes harvesting very easy. And as you can see, they got trays and trays and trays of different kinds of sprouts. I think these are some kind of radish sprouts and they probably got some clover and alfalfa sprouts growing on here as well. Now these sprouts are the little green sprouts. So they're just growing them to about this height. They're gonna pretty much harvest them and then they're gonna be out probably maybe even tomorrow for lunch or for dinner here. So besides these sprouts, which are the green style sprouts, which are the sprouts that I like the most, they're also doing uh, some bean sprouts. Now you can't eat all bean sprouts raw. There's only certain varieties of beans that you can't sprout and eat. Other ones will get you really sick. So uh, the ones they're doing here I think are Something like these guys, these are the mung bean sprouts. Also they're doing some of the, I guess a fenugreek sprouts look like, and also some of the, uh, maybe some lentil sprouts as well. And how they use these sprouts is they simply soak them and then they spread them for just a few days just to get a short little tail on them. They're not gonna grow out this big and then you're ready to eat them. So that's one way you could easily grow some sprouts even in just some old bowls in your house in a colander. I mean, they're just using these little pitchers here to grow their sprouts. So those are two sprouting methods. The third way is the way in soil, and that's the way I like the most, but it's also a little bit more complicated. So let's uh, go ahead and show you guys some of the different sprouts they're growing in trays next. As you can see here, now we're where they grow all the sprouts in the trays, and uh, one of the main things they grow here is the wheatgrass. They really encourage wheatgrass, and actually Hippocrates Health Institute was founded in Boston by Dr. Ann Wigmore, and she was really into her wheatgrass. Now, Yes, the wheatgrass is a grass and how they use it here is actually they juice it because we are unable to really digest the grass like a cow can because it has multiple stomachs and chews up its cud and all this kind of stuff. So, But by juicing the grass, you can effectively get the nutrition out of the grass into you to get more green in your life. And that's why my channel is called Growing Your Greens. Although that being said, I don't often drink wheatgrass juice. I will, but I prefer to grow you know, green plants in my garden like the kale and the cauliflower greens and the other kind of greens that are a lot easier to grow than 
trades of wheatgrass because I have a yard. If I didn't have a yard, I'd definitely be growing some wheatgrass to get some green in me because it's all good. So a tray of wheatgrass could maybe get about 16 ounces plus or minus on average and it also depends when you harvest it. They're really careful to uh, harvest it before the jointing stage and the jointing stage is simply when the grass grows up and is a single blade and then it joints, then it actually turns into two blades. So you want to harvest it before that stage for the optimal amount of nutrition. And uh, as you can see here, it's just grown in the soil. This is the soil they added up to halfway. And as you can see, there's massive root mass down here. Basically, at this point, the plant is mostly feeding off the seeds and they want to harvest the grass before it really starts sucking up nutrients from the, um, the, the roots there. So really, the energy that's going into the greens are from the sun and from the seeds alone. Now, besides the wheatgrass, they're growing some other crops here that I really like a lot. Up top here, we got some buckwheat greens. So uh, I do not recommend juicing the buckwheat greens, but it is all right to include uh, sometimes in your salad. Um, it can cause some issues with uh, sensitivity in your fingers when you're getting too much of a certain naturally occurring toxin in there. So you don't want to concentrate it. But eating some sprouts of buckwheat greens, you know, shouldn't be an issue for most people. But once again, I always encourage you guys to rotate your diet. So don't always grow buckwheat greens and eat those every single meal. No. Grow this for like this week and eat buckwheat this week. Next week, do some sunflower greens like they have here. And then the next week, do something like these. These are the pea greens right here. And there's so many other different kinds of micro greens that you can grow in this same fashion like they're growing. So once again, this is in half soil. And uh, you know all they do is they just seed the seeds down there, cover it, and then um, let it start sprouting up. And then they take the cover off so that it could actually green up. I'm not gonna go into really how you grow these guys today, but I have some couple good past episodes on actually how to specifically grow your wheatgrass and your sunflower greens. And if you come to Hippocrates, you'll actually get classes on how to do and make fabulous greens like they're growing here. I guess that's pretty much it for this greenhouse. The next area that I'm really excited about showing you guys is their brand new farm here that they just started about a year ago. So it's in its fledgling stage and I'm gonna show you guys how they're growing what they're growing here, and uh, more importantly, what some of the students that are coming to Hippocrates are learning. And now we're standing outside the Hippocrates Health Institute organic farm, and that's what they recommend here. They recommend people eat organic foods, and uh, they're growing organic foods. So I'm gonna ensure that they're using only organic approved uh, things on their farm. But anyways, they're uh, growing in several different areas, and this is a very valuable learning experience for you guys to learn that there's not just one way to grow. I mean. What I show you guys in my videos is the way I would do it in many instances when I set up container gardens, raised bed gardens and stuff. But there's many ways to garden just because I show you guys a way. I mean, that's the way I use. That's the way you guys might want to experiment with. But there's other ways to do it. And they're doing many different kinds of gardening here, including container garden, raised bed garden, even just standard field crops and growing in rows like you would at a regular farm. Plus, they have like a hoop house and a shade house. So they have many different kind of environments that they can uh, put the plants that need that kind of environment because here in South Florida, especially in the summertime, the weather can be quite harsh. Some people believe you can't grow food in South Florida in the summertime, but you know the people that say you can't grow because it's too hot, because it's too cold. I mean, look at nature around us. As you can see, I mean, there's grass, there's palms, there's all kinds of different shrubs growing. So, I mean, things grow. The problem is when you try to grow like northern crops that aren't used to the sunny South Florida weather, then you run into some issues and that's why they normally grow in South Florida in the winter season when it's cooler and they can grow the cooler crops. So here I'm proud to say that they're growing some, you know, heat tolerant crops, but they're also growing some ones, you know, in, in a different way that you could actually get away with growing here in South Florida. So uh, let's actually come inside the uh, farm and tour you guys some of these areas and what they're doing here. So the first area of the farm here is their hoop house, which is a hoop and it also has a shade cloth on it. They have a whole bunch of different areas in here. First, they have these grow tables, which are really nice. I wish I had some of these myself. And uh, they're actually starting some different uh, plants, including uh, passion fruits and uh, marigolds, lamb's quarters, magenta spring lamb's quarters. That's really cool. Some stevia they started from seed, all different kinds of things. Oh, swamp, pink mallow, plantain, uh, cumin, black cumin, wolf berries, so they got the goji berries started. I think this is really cool that they're experimenting with a lot of different kinds of crops to see what's going to really do well in this climate, in this growing situation. 
I mean, you know, if they started to try to grow things that are just common that, you know, people try to grow in uh, New York, you know, in the summertime, it's not going to do well here because this is a high humidity area and actually fairly high heat as well. And a lot of normal crops won't make it. So I really appreciate that they're experimenting. And I want to encourage you guys to experiment also with all kinds of different crops because you may find some crops that do well or do better than others. And there's no way you'll learn this aside from trying it yourself and finding out. And guess what? A pack of seeds is really cheap. Let's uh, continue to move on and show you guys uh, what's uh, growing on here. And as you can see, they got different uh, flats here of seedlings growing. And actually, these are the very seedlings that some of the health educators started on their own. So they take classes on how to grow food in their health education program. These are the people that are gonna go out to the world and start teaching people about eating healthier and growing your own food, frankly. And that's what they've done here. And everybody has a little uh, tag on there. And so this is Brian's tray. And I think it's not doing quite as well as the one here. So Rich, W, you kick ass. Brian, you need to take some more uh, seed dispersal classes because they're not quite growing as well. <laughs> All right, oh, so back over here, check it out, man. They got so many cool things growing. I'm, growing, I'm going nuts here. Uh, over here, they got some of my favorite leafy greens. This is actually called the Red Vein Sorrel. Also looks like they got some watercress there. And here's some uh, standard sorrel. So the sorrels are some plants that may do well in this hot heat, and they're just growing these in little containers. So you know, whether you have a full yard or a little balcony, you can definitely grow in containers like this. And if you have a lot of containers, you could actually grow a lot of food. I would have no problem coming out here any day of the week and picking one leaf out of all these plants. It'll actually make you a nice salad. In addition, besides this, um, over here, they got these guys over here and they're growing some anise hyssop and lemon balm and more favorite, uh, one of my favorite plants, the shiso. So last year I grew the shiso and the shiso is a very good crop to grow in a high heat situation. I grew these in Las Vegas and here it's uh, not only hot but also humid and they're probably going to do good here. I like the red variety. So this is actually related to the mint family and the shiso makes actually little seeds that are actually high in omega-3 fatty acids. So uh, And so if the seeds have the omega-3 fatty acids, so do the leaves. So eat your shiso leaves, people. <laughs> Next we want to go out into the other areas of the garden, I think we'll hit the container garden next. They have some amazing containers and some cool irrigation set up to water the containers that I haven't seen before. This is an amazing container garden. All these containers are, are they're just large plastic pots. These are the same pots that they use to put like trees in. So they're like large nursery pots. They're very thin plastic. I think these guys run, you know, at a local hydroponic shop near me. I bought some for about 10 bucks. So for 10 bucks, you could have a nice large container, fill it up with some soil, and grow some food in really simple so uh, you know one of the cool things I like here is that they're growing a wide variety of food I haven't seen such a wide variety of food pretty much grow anywhere else in South Florida that I've been I mean it's amazing that they're experimenting with a lot of different kinds of foods but more importantly a lot of nutrient dense foods like some of the uncommon leafy greens because the common ones like lettuce frankly in the summertime in uh, South Florida they're not gonna do well but check this guy out this stuff is called Perslane and the purslane, while it is getting uh, eaten by a few bugs, looks like it's doing really well. And purslane is definitely a green that's high in omega-3 fatty acids. It's a nice succulent style leaf. And for many people, the purslane actually grows as a weed, but they're actually cultivating it here. Now, I do want to mention that on purslane, there's different kinds of purslane. So you got your common garden weed purslane, which kind of creeps along the ground. And then you got more erect versions of purslane, which is this, which is the cultivated kind. So if you're going to grow it, I definitely encourage you guys to grow, order some seeds and grow the upright varieties. Some of them actually have fairly large leaves and will give you more food than just the common weed type purslane. But that being said, they're actually all edible. Here's just a little smaller container here with some uh, parsley growing. They got more purslane. Here's some chives. So let's go over here for a second. This is uh, one of my favorite herbs. I love herbs, whether they're medicinal or not. This is actually called the uh, hot and spicy oregano. So this is oregano. But the, the trick on this, and I've grown this, when you eat it, to me it kind of tastes like a hot pepper, man. It'll light up your mouth. Woo. And you know, all the different flavors in the foods are different flavonoids. And these are the different flavonoids that are like basically nutrients for us. I mean, they have things like uh, oregano extract on the market that kills bacteria and whatnot. So I mean, why buy these extracts when you could actually just pick and harvest your own oregano and put it in your meals every night? Not only will it make your food taste good, but it's also give you some uh, 
good nutrition that most people aren't eating. Over here is something probably that said they couldn't be done. I'm really surprised that they're growing this stuff here. It's uh, actually, the ground is actually quite moist in here. And this stuff is actually called the chickweed. So the chickweed, you know, in South Florida underneath the tree, it's growing really great. And I mean, this thing in, uh, in my garden is literally a weed. And uh, in the winter, probably like uh, springtime, it comes up so hardcore. This thing will drop seeds and reseed itself and keep coming back. But to me, this is an excellent edible salad green. And it looks like it's doing very well here in South Florida underneath the shade of a tree. Mmm, definitely really good. In addition, I like that they're growing things like in this container here, which they have labeled, which is really nice. I really like places that label their stuff because a lot of the, the visitors here that come in for the program, frankly, probably have never seen things growing before, don't know about things growing, can't identify chickweed like I can and identify the majority of the plants here. So it's really great that they have the tags so, so people can get to know the plants because a big part of what they do here is about education. You know, all the crops they grow here, whether it's the fruit trees on property or the vegetables on property, are the number one goal for them are to use in the education of the people that come here and to serve it as the food for the, the people that come here because the homegrown food here, Hippocrates, is probably the best food that they could be serving to their guests because local food, high quality food grown in compost and rock dust minerals, which they do use here, is, you know, some of the best food in my opinion. So here in the tropics, they're growing ginger. Ginger's an excellent tropical uh, perennial to grow. If you live anywhere in South Florida, you definitely want to grow some ginger. And also another tuberous root that they're growing next door, which is, in my opinion, more nutrient dense than the, the ginger. And that's right here. It's not coming up yet. It's actually the turmeric. So I love the turmeric. It's actually a really good anti-inflammatory. The curcumin's in there, anti-inflammatory. And uh, hopefully they'll be coming up here really soon. And once again, the turmeric needs to be grown in a place where there's a long season and it doesn't freeze. So, you know, if you maybe have a greenhouse in California, you could do that. But South Florida is a perfect place to grow acres of turmeric. I mean, they do that in Hawaii. And, you know, you, and literally to start the turmeric or the ginger, you can just buy little roots at your store and plant them and uh, keep them watered and warm and they'll come up for you. Continuing on, they got, a, you know, a container full of weeds or many people might say that. These are the same dandelions that you might find in your lawn. But these are actually French dandelions, and they spelt it wrong. They spelt it dandy lion, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how it's spelt. These are all edible, and these are some super greens. You could use the greens, the roots, and even the flower stalks. All edible and really good for you, although it's definitely an acquired taste. <laughs> we got to keep on moving here. Oh, here's another cool one, man. Now, to me, this is what the kind of stuff that should be grown in South Florida. You know, not the standard northern vegetables, but you want to grow the tropical perennial vegetables here in South Florida. This is actually called the cranberry hibiscus, also called roselle, and this makes a fabulous, nice, large, shrubby, bushy thing. I grew this over the summer, uh, last summer in California, and it doesn't like the frost, but during the summertime it grew amazingly well, and uh, what you could do is literally, this grows as a shrub, you could pick every leaf and eat it. It has a nice, sorrelly flavor. And man, so delicious. I only get this when I come to the tropics. In addition, besides the leaves, they make these nice little flower buds that they use the flower buds to make like a lemonade type drink as well. I wish they had other perennial vegetables that are native to the tropics that'll do well. You can literally plant it once and it'll grow forever. It's like, so imagine a, a hedge full of shrubs that are all edible. So there's some crops like katuk and Okinawan spinach and they have a purple variety and a green variety that they can literally grow as ground cover that's all edible. In addition, another great thing to grow and use as ground cover here in the garden would be what's called perennial peanut or perennial peanut grass. It actually grows as a ground cover. It's nitrogen fixing, so it's adding nutrients to the soil, but it also covers the area so that you don't have to, you know, it chokes out the weeds. So that's definitely really cool. I've, you know, uh, been to Hawaii and that's what they do in Hawaii and uh, this would be a similar climate. So uh, over here, they have another cool one I grew once. I don't particularly care for it. It's actually called Salad Burnett. I really think it's ultimately cool that they're just growing so many different varieties of things. I mean, this is like something you'd find in my garden, but it's here at Hippocrates. And I'm sure, you know, because it is their first year, they're trying a whole bunch of different things to see what does good, what doesn't. And, you know, they may keep some of them up just because they're new and different and the chefs in the kitchen might want this flavor of this herb or, you know, uh, leafy green or whatever. Oh, we got it. We passed by this one. This is one of my favorites. This is the stevia. So the stevia is another excellent crop to grow here in the summertime, even in the middle of the hot summer here in South Florida. The stevia will do really well. 
you can see here it's actually starting to bolt and go to flower and besides the leafy greens that are edible now stevia is known as a sweet leaf it's actually a sugar substitute with no sugar in it tastes wow it's really sweet the flowers are also edible it's rare that i get to eat stevia flowers and then it goes to seed so it looks like these went to seed and now the seeds are kind of blowing in the wind and those are little stevia seeds right there let me go ahead and spread some stevia seeds in the wind I've had other videos on stevia. Stevia is an amazing uh, green. You could actually use it to flavor up smoothies and make teas out of it. I want to show you guys this cilantro here. Number one, it attracts beneficial insects. So you can see the, uh, the bees there just going around to the cilantro plant and uh, actually getting the pollen. And uh, when the cilantro plant actually gets too warm for the cilantro, it, it does what's called bolts. So when the plant bolts, it actually goes into its reproductive stage. It's no longer at its leafing stage and not really going to make much more food for you in the sense of the leaves. But what it will make are the cilantro flowers. And I've often shown that you can eat the cilantro flowers and actually they have an amazing flavor. On some levels, I like the cilantro flowers when they're in this stage much more than actually the cilantro itself. Hmm. So good. After the cilantro flowers are formed, they get uh, pollinated and then you can see here it starts producing these little seeds these are the seed pods they are green at this point and they're very immature but after that stage we could go over here to another stage and these are when the seeds get bigger and over on this side these seeds are actually dried up so i'm glad that they're actually uh, saving the seeds here and now these seeds actually can be harvested right here and now they could grow these for next year or actually you could use these seeds as a coriander spice because the uh, the leaves of the cilantro plant or the cilantro and the seeds are actually called the coriander Maybe I'll go ahead and snack on one of these guys and mm, nice and spicy. I always want to encourage my viewers actually to grow edible flowers. So we saw some cilantro that they're growing here. Now the flowers are edible and they'll make great garnishes on dishes to you know make things look pretty and they'll also give people a flavor kick because people generally haven't had cilantro flowers. So I would encourage them to use like a lot of the different crops here in the in the you know meals that they serve every night to make things look cool but also give new taste sensations plus they'll be able to use more of the the food they're actually growing on site like maybe if the the kitchen manager came out every day and just took a walk and just picked some certain herbs to like put in tonight's dish that'd be a great effective use of some of the food here uh, besides that i want we're going to talk about the flowers and you know here's another flower that's really great to grow in your garden these are just a standard garden nasturtium. Many of you guys may be growing these now. Many of you guys may not know that they are completely edible. They look cool. And besides the flowers being edible, they give you a little peppery kick. The leafy greens are also edible too. They're just a lot more stronger. So, you know, if I was adding some of these leafy greens to a salad, I'd add maybe one leaf to the whole salad and chop it up really small so I'd get small bits and it'll add some nice fire to your you know, mouth when you're eating your salad. In addition, next door here, we got some more flowers. These are probably my favorite edible flowers some uh, Johnny Jump Ups or Violas. Now the Johnny Jump Up flowers are edible and many people don't know that you can also eat the leaves of the, the Violas as well. They're quite good. Moving down, they got some more edible flowers here and these are the standard marigolds. So the marigolds are actually rich in uh, lutein and zeaxanthin. If you go into the health food store, they'll have like little supplements and pills that they actually take the extract of the flower petals for the lutein and zeaxanthin and they'll sell these in little pills for your eyes to help your eyes but you know I say why buy pills when you don't have to when you got nature nature in my opinion is much better than a pill bottle or things made in a factory you'll be able to just go out and pick your own flowers and sprinkle them in your salads the reason why in my opinion people need supplements is because they're not eating a healthy balanced diet including flowers like the marigolds they had one half of the containers on that side now they even got more containers here and you know in my opinion containers are an excellent way to grow in South Florida because literally we're sitting on top of a whole bunch of sand. There's not really much nutrients in the sand. And if you do try to enrich the sand, I mean, it's almost like a never ending batter. You pretty much have to bring in compost and grow on top of the sand instead of in the sand here. So by growing in a container, you're gonna save your soil. SOS, save our soil. <laughs> and uh, you can keep the soil and keep the nutrition in there and uh, you know keep growing in it year after year. I like to cycle what I'm growing in each container and keep changing it up so I'm never growing the same thing twice unless it is like some kind of perennial uh, vegetable like they're growing many of them here so uh, what we're gonna do next actually we're gonna show you guys some of the um, crops they're growing in containers here we'll start off with this one this is actually some royal burgundy bush beans they're actually growing up some uh, bamboo steaks that looks like they probably grew on site 
they look like they're doing all right. In general, what I've learned is that the Asian beans, you know, not the standard green beans, but the Asian varieties of beans will tend to do better in high heat areas. In addition, they got some lemon balm, and I want to talk a second for about herbs. So herbs are an excellent thing to grow in hot climates. Uh, herbs are the number one thing and easiest thing to grow. And uh, one of the things about the herbs is really cool is that you know you could grow the herbs and you're not using like a whole salad worth. You're just gonna use a few leaves of herbs to spice things up. So you could easily grow your herbs every season to you know meet your needs because you don't have to grow it as much as you would have to grow some lettuce to have like a salad because you're just using a small amount. Plus, in addition, you can dry your herbs or even use them for tea. So let's go ahead and show you guys some more plants that are growing in the containers. We got the cranberry hibiscus here. They got the uh, sunchokes or drew some artichokes right here coming up in the middle along with some other uh, weeds in here and some uh, parsley. But uh, this is the uh, drew some artichokes. And as you can see, these are the sunchokes here. They're actually starting to sprout. And actually, in my opinion, this should be covered up with a little bit more soil right there. But these guys should also do really well. These are a Native American crop, so they're native to the Americas when the white man came. In addition, it looks like they maybe had some uh, lemongrass over in here and they got a whole bunch of different peppers. Now peppers are probably one of the best crops you can grow in South Florida. They really love the heat and this is probably some kind of uh, a pepper for maybe Trinidad, probably a hot style small variety. And uh, one of the things they are doing here in these containers is that they're only filling them up you know, the container is maybe two feet tall approximately, and they're only filling about a foot of soil. Now, there's pros and cons to that. I mean, the pro is that you're not going to have to use as much soil. The uh, con is that there's not going to be as much soil in there for the roots to spread out in. So if it was my container and I was growing the pepper plant, I'd probably fill the soil almost up to the top to allow the most soil and the most microbial action going on in the soil and a, a lot of space for the roots to grow out because the larger the root ball could get, the healthier the plant could be, the more it could produce, and the, and the more solid it's going to be. Let's continue to move on. Right here, what they had in here before was more of the cilantro. So the cilantro, in my opinion, is maybe not the best crop to be grown here in South Florida because it is a pretty fast turn crop, especially when it gets warm. I personally grow the cilantro in the cool winter or the spring or fall, not the middle of the summer. Uh, it does tend to bolt very fast, but if you want the cilantro flavor, Without growing cilantro, you know, all you need to do is grow this other herb called culantro. Culantro is a tropical plant that tastes just like cilantro. And I had it actually in a past episode when I was in uh, Houston, pl planted out two different varieties of cilantro and a culantro. It would be interesting to go back there in a few months and see that the cilantros are done and the culantro is growing strong, still providing food for my friend that I helped him set up his. A crate raised bed garden there. Let's continue moving in this garden. Looks like they have some more peppers. And man, this is one bountiful pepper plant. I don't know the variety, but these all look like little cherry type tomatoes, but these are little small peppers. And I'm sure they're actually quite hot at that. But I mean, even a container, you can grow a significant amount of peppers. I mean, hot peppers are another cool thing to grow because you, you don't need a whole lot of hot peppers unless you're of maybe uh, Latin descent where you really like hot spicy stuff. I mean, just one hot pepper in like one whole bowl of food would probably spice it up so you'll have easily enough hot peppers for you to eat fresh and then dry for the winter. In addition, another crop that's going to do really well here are the basils. And there's so many different varieties of basil. They just got a standard sweet basil here. And the sweet basils and the basils here in South Florida can grow as whole shrubs and trees and be pretty much like perennials. And man, wow, this stuff smells really good. And tonight I'm actually going to eat dinner here. Maybe I'll even have some uh, pesto <laughs> for dinner. But if you do want to come, you can eat dinner or lunch here pretty much any day of the week. It costs $20 for all you could eat, but you know you can't get a tour of the place. You can just come in for dinner. But I definitely think that for $20, all you could eat, organic food is definitely a good deal. See, they keep moving. They got peppers. They got some uh, onions here growing. Oh, here's some carrots in the containers. They got some nice large carrots growing in there. And uh, oh, some beets, man. Look at how these beets are growing. These are some crazy large beets. So here's just some of the beet here in the container here. And it's just basically half out of the ground, half in the ground. And besides just harvesting the beet root, I want to remind you guys that you can harvest the little beet greens. Let me see if I can just find a little small beet green here. So these little small beet greens, you know, the baby greens are my favorite greens to eat because they're more delicate, not as tough. If you do want to harvest the larger ones, I would definitely juice them or put them into a green smoothie. And you want to remember the beets are basically in the, in the same family as the spinach. Mm. 
quite good. I can say definitely the stuff grown here is quite sweet. Let's see, they got more peppers here and I think that pretty much rounds it out for all the container garden. Next, we're actually gonna go into the section where they're growing in the raised beds. Before we get to the raised beds, I was just walking by this section here and what they got here is probably one of the most useful trees you can grow in South Florida. This is actually called the Moringa tree. So the Moringa tree is a fast growing tree and if you go to the health food store, once again, you could buy Moringa leaf powder that's powdered up and it's like $20 a pound. But if you live in South Florida, you could literally plant one of these trees that'll pretty much grow and grow and grow and grow and you could harvest the leaves at any time to eat. These are really nutritious uh, leafy greens that are really a low maintenance crop. In addition, these are really easy to propagate. All you do is once they get established, you hack it back. You could take that uh, hack back cutting, stick it in the ground, it'll grow into a new tree and then the hack back part will grow again. So this is really cool. I really like the Moringa a lot and I'm glad they're growing a lot of starts here. Hopefully they're just going to start including these all around the landscape here at Hippocrates so that any guest could come up to a Moringa tree and start eating their lunch if they don't want to go into the lunch hall. Now we're going to look at the raised beds. So besides growing in containers, which I like for the South Florida area, growing in the raised beds are another good way because now you're bringing in the soil. You're not going to plant in the native soil, which is pretty much just sand here. I mean, after all, this is called West Palm Beach. We're on a beach and this is sand. So uh, by raising up the level of the soil and bringing in your own organic compost, you're going to have much greater levels of success than just trying to grow in some sand that probably doesn't have a whole lot of nutrition in there. As you can see here, they have two different raised bed styles. They have these guys here, which are basically like some uh, uh, two by tens with some uh, two by twos holding the, the corners up. And they basically uh, only fill these halfway. So uh, one of my pet peeves is when you build high raised beds and you only fill them up halfway. Now, you know, I'm not familiar with growing specifically here in South Florida. They may do this for, you know, to provide more shade and keep some of the crops cool. But, uh, you know, and that might be the valid reason for doing that. I personally, if I had raised beds this tall, I would fill them up to the top. Or if I wasn't going to use the full way, I'd actually cut them down in half and then make double the amount of raised beds. Uh, over here, you can see they're starting to uh, build some new raised bed design. And how they're doing this is they're basically just taking some uh, two by six and they're cutting it out. And this is where the... Uh, the joints are going to go into and they're just taking some uh you know like some rebar to uh you know put in there so this is almost like little lincoln log set where they could just uh you know put these together like this and then they need no additional support these are going to be actually very sturdy and very stable to last and be quite durable so i'm sure they're going to be building this and finishing this really soon and filling this up, filling it up with some good compost and a good soil mix and uh, growing more food. Now we're sitting in between two of the raised beds and they're growing many different crops in the raised beds. Things like carrots and cilantro and parsley and they got some radishes that looks like they're doing very well. They're actually quite densely planted and there's a lot of little radishes down here that they can harvest. They pretty much serve radishes like every every meal at, on the salad bar because they have a nice big salad bar you get to choose from. I mean they could easily fulfill their radish needs by growing just a few beds of radishes and radishes are what I call quick turn crops because they can be ready in as few as like 20 days for some varieties. In addition, I want to encourage you guys to eat the radish greens. The radish greens are, you know, a nice edible leafy green, although I wouldn't make a whole salad out of them. Add a few leaves to a salad with other mixed greens. Over on this side, they're growing a lot of carrots. Uh, carrots, in my opinion, take a little bit longer to grow than radishes and I'd probably, you know, I personally tend to buy my carrots because I don't want to waste space in my garden for the carrots. That being said, you can not only harvest the carrot roots that we're all used to, but the carrot greens are also edible and many people don't know that. That being said, they don't have quite the best flavor, but they're edible. Yeah, I don't like carrot greens too much. I think I'd go for the radish greens first. More spicy and peppery. Now we're going to look at the compost facility here at Hippocrates. They're doing composting on a big scale because they feed all the people a plant-based diet. They grow basically flats and flats and trays and trays of the wheatgrass, the sunflower greens, the buckwheat greens, and the pea sprouts. And they cut the trays off and then they got to do something with that soil in the bottom and the root mass. So what better thing to do with that stuff and the food scraps from the kitchen than to compost it and make their own soil here so they could stop being dependent on buying soil. So you can see here, here are some of the flats that are actually, some of them are continuing to grow in the compost. And also the juice pulp, they create lots of juice every day. And uh, here's where they're actually mixing in some food scraps with the leaves because it's very important to get a mixture of browns and greens or carbons and nitrogen. 
to make sure you have a compost ball that's actually working instead of just rotting. One of my mottos is compost happens, but I always encourage you guys to make it happen as fast as possible so that you can be creating more soil for your garden instead of importing it and buying it from someone else. Be sure to check my past videos where I have a few good episodes on composting and how I've really dialed it in and to make it work really efficiently in like a drawer form compost using my food scraps plus also some standard pine pellets that are available at a, a feed supply store near you normally used for horse bedding. So, you know, besides the composting here, regular composting, they're also doing worm composting. So let's take a look at that next. Besides the standard compost and they're doing here at Hippocrates, they also have worm composting. You might be thinking, John, what's better, man? Regular composting or worm composting? Well, I think they're both great and you should do whatever draws you to it. I mean, if you want to do static composting in a hot pile or a spinning composter like I do, that's great. If you want to do worms, that's great. So if I had to choose one, I'd choose a spinning composter myself because then you don't have to take care of your worms and, and worry about your worms because these are live creatures that you do need to pay some attention to. You got to remember to keep feeding them because they'll eat about a pound of food for one pound of worms a day. Plus you need to keep the, the temperature just right. Can't be too hot, can't be too cold. Plus the moisture level is also very important. So, you know, instead of some fancy worm bin like many places or just some worm box they made out of wood, they're using something really simple, more standard nursery pots. So this is standard feed trough or like a big nursery pot. And they all they have in here is like a big old sheet. And then underneath here, wow, you can see all these crazy worms and creatures. Some of them are actually some centipedes actually that I don't know about, but I'm sure under the ground, are some uh, worms and I'm not gonna necessarily dig in there today. <laughs> so this is how they use some of the food scraps that is created here at Hippocrates. They feed it to the worms to make the worm castings so that they could actually uh, enrich their garden with some of the worm castings. But besides the worm castings, I'm also really happy that they're making compost tea here. So let me show you their rudimentary compost tea setup because it really isn't that hard to make. So this is a simple compost tea setup they have. It's nothing more than a five gallon bucket with a stick and a bag hanging. Oh! <laughs> that was splashing everywhere. But this bag was uh, pretty much suspended on this stick here. And uh, this is the, basically the bag that they put the worm castings and the compost in. And then they got an air bubbler. So where's the air bubbler? Here's the air bubblers here. Oh, oh man, they got a small air bubbler. I'd highly encourage them to get a larger air bubbler, man. The more you can oxygenate your, your water, the better. And uh, check it out, man. They just got a standard Petco aquarium pump. Now, while this pump is good, I definitely recommend like an active aqua pump, which is an industrial pump that's gonna pump a lot more air into the water and also a nice larger air stone from like a hydroponic store. I mean, the more air you can get in there, the better because then the microbes are gonna go nuts. Now, the reason for the compost tea is not because of the nutrition, but it's for the microbes, the beneficial bacteria and the microbes in there are basically gonna perforate and when they get into your soils, they're actually gonna create more nutrients for your plants so that your plants could thrive. So I'm really glad that they're doing the compost tea here. Oh, another, another additive to the compost tea is molasses because this is what that keeps the uh, bacteria happy and multiplying. You know, there's many different recipes for compost teas and you know, I recommend the Boogie Brew compost tea because it's an all-in-one solution, one-stop shop. It's a, it's a really good compost tea that's already made so that you don't have to come up with your own recipe and to go through these trials and tribulations to get the recipe just right to have the maximum results. I'm all about saving time, saving money, and letting somebody else do all the, the legwork and you just reap the benefits. And that's why I like the Boogie Brew compost tea. And stay tuned for an upcoming episode where we're going to have an open source compost tea episode where I'm going to get with the owner of the Boogie Brew Compost Tea Company and he's going to share his secrets on what is in his compost tea and how you can start formulating your own. So it's going to be a really good episode, hopefully, within the next few months. Aside from the compost tea that they're creating here, you know, besides the standard compost, worm castings, compost tea, one of the other things that I really like a lot is the, uh, the rock dust, of course, and I'm glad they're using rock dust supplementation here on their organic farm. It's very important, in my opinion. It's one of the most important things you can add to your garden and actually... I'm learning something new today like I visit every farm. I always learn something new at every farm. It's really cool to expand my knowledge but also share this with you guys. So what I'm finding today is called Dragonite. Now who wants to add some Dragonite to their garden? This is actually called the premier quality rock dust for robust soil fertility. The secret of the ancients for rejuvenating soil. 2.2 pounds, so that's actually one kilo. This is one kilo of the Dragonite rock dust that I haven't heard about so I'm actually gonna have to contact this company and 
see if I can get some samples to try and share with you guys. Now, the way this is sold, and I know Premier Research Labs is like a company that sells like a lot of supplements, so 2.2 .2 pounds of this stuff is probably pretty spendy. I'd rather get a larger quantity of the Azomite, but I definitely want to try this. You might be thinking, John, what's better, man, the Azomite or the Dragonite or the Gaia Green Glacial Rock Dust? You know what I say is I say you add all the different kinds of rock dust because every different kind of rock dust will have different levels of nutrition or different levels of minerals in there. And through adding all the different kinds of the minerals, you're going to get the most you know, beneficial effect of all this, all the different kinds of minerals in there because one kind of rock dust may not have all the minerals as another kind. And if you can't get the horticultural grade rock dust like you are here, even get some river silt or some, you know, crushed up powdered rocks from a local stone quarry because that's going to be probably better in most cases than not adding them. In addition, real quick, while we're over here, I wanted to show you guys this. I mean, this is what many of you guys can do. It's really simple. This is a standard two liter bottle. They took it, they cut off the top, they inverted it upside down, they stuck a straw in here, the bottom has a, a water reservoir, they probably have a couple holes in there, and this is literally a self-watering container made out of a two-gallon pot. Now, how many of you guys could take some two-gallon, you know, uh, drink containers, cut them in half, and fill up your patio outside with these little containers to start your plants or even grow some small plants in? I mean, I'd probably feel fine with growing something like some herbs or even some lettuce in here. I probably wouldn't grow any pepper tomato plants in here unless they're just little seedlings but this is a great way to re reuse the plastic that's probably not getting recycled and probably going to end up in the pacific gyre anyways to grow more food in so that you can eat healthier i guess the last part of the tour i want to give you guys today is the field crops that they're growing and they definitely have a lot of them because that's probably where they're making the majority of the food they're growing here at the hippocrates organic farm now we're in the standard row crop garden and pretty much while these are in rows they basically raise up the soil enrich the soil and they're growing in little raised beds without sides and that's what you could think of row crops and they have these all in rows now they have many different kinds of irrigation systems they're probably experimenting with this whole area is actually irrigated with overhead irrigation and it looks like it's doing amazingly here we have some bok choy and uh, bok choy is an amazing crop to grow in the heat although you do have to use it before you lose it because pretty soon this stuff is actually going to bolt and they're going to lose it so hopefully they'll be serving this at one of the uh, dinners uh, or meals here at Hippocrates. Besides the bok choy, they got different things like beans, uh, peppers, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, chard, um, tomatoes, all kinds of different things growing in different row crops. They have a whole bunch of different things growing here in South Florida. I mean, here it is in uh, eight, late April, and they got the celery growing, they got some peppers growing, they got some lima beans growing, and they got some corn growing. Now, if you like corn, I highly encourage you guys to plant your own corn and get organic seeds because, you know, corn nowadays is being genetically modified and I'm not in favor of any gen genetically modified foods. And I, personally, I won't even buy non-organic corn, corn seeds to plant unless they're tested and for sure genetic modification free. So that's why I recommend, you know, uh, organic seeds. That being said, corn is not a vegetable. Did you know that? Corn is actually a grain. Corn is derived from this uh, grain called teosinte, which is basically non-edible and it's been hybridized over the years to in, into the corn we know. Now, I love eating corn whenever I could get some good organic corn, but corn does not make up any large portion of my diet at all. And if you want to eat your corn, I definitely recommend you grow it yourself. Now we're in another part of the field and they have many different rows planted out in many different crops. Right here they have the uh, peppers. These are actually called sereno peppers and uh, they do make a hot sauce here in the kitchen to serve to the guests. And uh, since growing their garden here, they haven't probably had to buy any hot peppers because they have a whole field of them. Now they do feed people a lot of sweet peppers here, so it might not be economical to grow all their sweet peppers, but they could easily meet their needs of the hot peppers because you don't need to grow as many hot peppers because you're not eating them like sweet peppers. You're just adding a few for that hot, uh, you know, spiciness that it's in the pepper. One of the things I want to point out here is that these guys are producing very well. These plants are nice and large and they have lots of peppers on each one. And when I harvest my peppers, and I would encourage you guys also to uh, wait till they're fully ripe. Although you can buy the green peppers in the stores, you know, for use in your kitchen. You know, these green peppers on this plant here will turn red. And I only encourage you guys to harvest your uh, Solanaceae family plants, including tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers when they're fully ripe so they'll have the least amount of toxins within them. In addition, the flavor will be much more, you know, vibrant and taste much better. Uh, the other thing that they're doing here is they're spacing their plants appropriately. 
So they space these plants about, you know, uh, 12 inches apart, which is a really good spacing because as you can see, once the plants grow out and have their, create their canopy, they're just about touching each other. So by this way, by maximizing your spacing, you're gonna be able to fit the most crops in cr to create the most amount of food. One of the crops I'm really happy to see that they're growing here at Hippocrates, in my opinion, they should have a lot more of this stuff, is the Malbar spinach. The Malbar spinach, they're definitely growing it right. They put up the trellis in advance because this is a viner, this is a climber. It's gonna actually vine up this, and if I was them, I might even make it taller because this thing will easily devour this uh, trellis really easily. This guy's gonna grow up and all these nice, large, succulent leaves are nice and edible and most people have never tasted Malbar spinach leaves. They're actually a nice succulent leaf with a really neutral flavor and be great addition to any salad. And once again, this is a tropical vegetable. You can grow it in northern climates in the summertime for a short season. But here in South Florida, if you have a mild winter, it'll grow throughout the winter. And it just keeps putting on leaves. And I've seen some Malabar spinach leaves like that big. They get really huge. And then you could use them for even wraps. Really cool. And there are two varieties of the Malabar spinach. They have a red variety, which has a red stem, and a green variety. They're only growing the red variety here. So I guess they discriminate against green plants. Well, I think actually everything else here is green. But hopefully they'll start including the green Malabar spinach to have a a variation and they could grow like a green a red a green a red and hey wait those are christmas colors and maybe they'll even have malabar spinach in december if the weather's uh mild enough and doesn't get too cold so now we're in the brussels sprout forest you might be thinking john how come these don't look like the brussels sprouts in the store with those little stalks and those little mini cabbage heads well you know in my garden sometimes the brussels sprouts don't head up right and they don't look like the store but you know what that's all right because the brussels sprout leaves are also edible and well Many of the things like the collard greens and the uh, Swiss chard are like harvested to the hilt here. They're not harvesting these guys yet. I think that's a terrible waste. So if you guys grow these, don't let them get this many greens on them because if you do, they're gonna go to waste. They'll start turning yellow just like this and they're gonna have to go in your compost pile instead of getting the nutrition into you. I'm sure they could use these to make something like wraps, a salad, you know, or even juice them to get the nutrition into the guests here because I think it's very important that you know they're growing the food here they need to feed it to the guests and hopefully one day they'll expand this garden so much that they could feed all the food to the guests so i hope you guys enjoy this episode once again my name is john kohler with growingyourgreens.com we'll see you next time and remember keep on growing